listening to the Battle Ready Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Erwin Raphael McManus. It's good to have you, sir. How are you? I am doing so good. I am wet and cold. Uh, this is uh, false advertising from L.A. <laughs> someone, someone just sent me a message, and they, and they said, you know, it's my dream to come to L.A. It's so dark and rainy here in Scandinavia. And I'm like, don't come right now. <laughs> It's not better. And apparently it's going to rain for the next like week or so. Wow. And I would be upset except that we live in um, a drought zone. So it's so good to have rain. It clears the atmosphere. It makes everything green. We, uh, it stops our trees from dying. That's why I'm excited that we have rain. We are such fragile beings, me and you. We, the environment affects us way too much. We're... We are we are not we are not made for this. We're made for sunny. We need to go to Miami, maybe. What, what I think is funny is that uh, my wife's uh, executive assistant Jasmine moved from Seattle to come to sunny LA, and she brought uh, gloomy Seattle with her. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy, and it just it because because we don't ever get it. Your your patterns aren't used to it. Like I was talking with New York friends. In New York, if it rains or snows, you just still do life. You still go out to yeah. dinner. You still see people. <laughs> Here, it's like, nope, this is an act of God. <laughs> I know. I have meetings today. I'm like, do I really have to go? I mean, I had to go from the house no. to the back house. <laughs> you don't have to go. It's the rain. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, have to go. I had to go from the house to the back house. And I said to my wife, Kim, can I borrow your car? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, That's so I had a funny thing happen last night before we dive into anything really serious. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a late night person. So I'm in the living room. I have headsets on. I'm watching some really bad movie with um, um, actors who are all my age. So you know that <laughs> they didn't spend a lot of money <laughs> on casting. And, uh, and all of a sudden, at 1230 at night, there is a light beaming through the window next to where I'm sitting on the sofa. It's, it's one of those intensity flashes. And I think, what's going what? on? Wait, what? Hold on, what? Yeah, there's a light beaming through the window from the outside into my living room. You for sure thought they were coming for you, huh? And I looked, and there was Maybe. a man standing at my window. Last night? What? Last night. Last night. There was a man standing at my window, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I thought, it's going to happen. We're going to throw down. <laughs> and, uh, and then he points me to the front door, and so I walk oh, over yeah. to the front door, and I have to make a <laughs> choice. Do I open the door, or do I keep him outside? And, uh, but you know me. And so I unlocked the door, and I opened it, and there were two men. Two men. There are two men. You have there. a little, you have a little peephole thing. <laughs> use your, use your, use the things around you. So it's pouring down rain. There are two guys standing in front of me in the middle of the night, and um, he says, "Do you own the black Lexus?" And I said, "That's my wife's car." And he said, um, "The back was opened," and so we stopped. And it looks like your car's been ransacked. And we just wanted to let you know. And I said, are you police? Because they didn't look like police. They had rain jackets on. He goes, yeah, no, we're, we're police. And I realized there was a police car right there behind her car. Oh. And uh, he goes, do you want to come check it? And I, and I said, not, not right now. And um, it's okay. I don't think there's anything in there that, you know, that was worthy of stealing. And so I, I closed it. I said, thank you so much. They got in their car and they just pulled around the corner and stayed there. I went and got my hoodie up and shoes and everything. And I ran to the car, got the keys right then and checked the car. And it had been ransacked and it was my wife's car. And so um, I, this is me. I, I got sanitary wipes and I started wiping down the whole car, cleaning it all up, organizing it, putting it back together, making it look better than new. So that when my wife, Woke up in the morning, she wouldn't know that the car had been broken into, wouldn't freak out because she goes at six in the morning to go get coffee. And um, and fortunately, it had been unlocked. Otherwise, they would have broken the window to get in. Um, 
But and then I found this morning that, you know, she did have something in there, but it wasn't something we, can, we can't live without. But uh, but wasn't that I mean, it was crazy. I mean, what would you do if somebody shines in one of those power small flashlights through your window at one o'clock in the morning? And would you open the door? I, I don't know. I don't know. But we need to sort this thing out. We need to. Uh, we've been talking about this forever. <laughs> but uh, you know, you what know, I was thinking about this. What? I live in a great neighborhood that is surrounded by not a great neighborhood. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's, that's a thing in LA and yeah. you know, every nice neighborhood is five blocks from a not so nice neighborhood and not yeah. even like a ghetto, but just a neighborhood. That's just an in-between neighborhood. We have a lot of in-between neighborhoods, like, you know, in between yeah. one neighborhood to the next, there's like a sketchy little eight block kind of, you know, perimeter and you live not far from one, but so do most people, right? I, I realized, I don't, know, I don't know why, but I can't sleep in the rain. I get very, like, I get like super high. I mean, I've, I've, my whole life have been tested for hypervigilance for situations like that growing up. Like, I, I mean, most people don't know this, but there was a time where people wanted to kill you yeah. and kill us. And you were very... Um, you've just always been very funny. Like, you know, I live in a house that's completely, it's a compound. Like you'd have to climb something 20 feet tall, tall to get inside my house and then I'll shoot you. But <laughs> I'm, I don't have any guns. I don't have any guns. But it, you don't, know, but it, like that makes me feel safe, makes me feel protected. It makes me feel like, okay, in a, in a city of chaos, I'm a little bit like tucked away. But it's not the same for you. And we've talked about this our whole life. And I don't know what it is. Is it like, you, do you enjoy feeling unsafe? No, it's the opposite. I just feel safe. I mean, I went decades without locking my doors. There's no way when the guy was knocking on the door that you felt safe. Uh, he wasn't knocking on the door. He was pointing a flashlight through the window. <laughs> but there's, yeah, but uh, yeah, don't be coy. Just answer the question. Uh, in that moment, I looked at him and I thought, oh, wow, this is Aaron, really Aaron, Aaron's right. Aaron's <laughs> right. We need to build the, the, build the walls. And, uh, but um, but I, I, I think that some of it is I don't I, – I just always feel safe. I can't explain it. Like I, I know I'm supposed to feel I'm in danger. I mean I'm walking distance from a pretty intensely commercial street. And I only locked the doors when you guys were children because I, I didn't want anything to happen to you. And I locked the doors, you, you know, when because your mom asked me to now. And but when everyone's out of town, I would sleep with the door open, and uh, so, the, so the dog could go in and out at their own discretion. I just never worried. You know, one thing though is one thing I would say is I've never had my car broken into more than live than when I've ever I've lived at your house. Whenever I've stayed the night at your house, whether I was driving a Jeep or driving, I've had like a few different cars over the years and all of them have been broken into at your house. Yeah. Which is crazy. I think people just, and that's an LA thing, right? Like people yeah. will just check doors. They yep. come by, check doors. I don't know. LA's feeling a lot like Sao Paulo right now. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, LA has its, its you know, its challenges, but. Uh, on on the upper on the good end, I asked my wife. She goes, "Oh, we had a really expensive piece of luggage in there, but it was full of of uh, table um, covers, you know, sheets." And so I said, "Well, I I hope they throw a great party." <laughs> and uh, but, and uh, but I would would have liked my piece of luggage back. But um, I, I I can't with you right now, and I'm going to lecture you later off air. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about safety. And we're going to talk about, and I'm, we're, we're building a wall. Jericho, my man, Jericho. That's all I'm saying. Yes. My, my, my guard dog is a 12 year old lab that doesn't get up <laughs> barely except to eat. Thatcher would, would, Thatcher would just roll over and be like, pet me. And so let's do a survey. If, if someone put a flashlight through your window, would you open the door or would you not open the door? <laughs> not open the door i'm sorry sir it was only 1 a.m so what you know it wasn't that late but, 1 a.m um, dad go to sleep earlier 
Bad things happen after midnight. I was so grateful I was awake. I was awake last night. I was texting you. I'd be like, I can't sleep. And you're like, use your headphones. I'm like, yeah. I turned my headphones on. I doze off, dad. And I heard some crazy, crazy noise. I don't know if lightning struck something by us, but like, it sounded like my door ringer thing. That's like a, it has like a, it's like an old, like ah, kind of bell in my house. It sounded like that. And I woke up and I was so startled. And then I just saw like light. And I was like, oh, it must've been like lightning thunder. And it had to have struck something, mm. but it was so unnerving. I was like, realized, like, I think I've had so much childhood trauma from people trying to, you know, snatch and grab us that I just was like, I, I, I don't feel safe home, home alone, you know? Yeah, no. And you know, so funny is that you can't sleep when it's raining. And uh, I pay for an app called Calm to listen to the rain so I can sleep. <laughs> so maybe while it's raining, I should put on my rain app. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i have to have sound to sleep some people will need to have silence but i i haven't known silence in a long time yeah okay so something happened and i want to keep things vague because i want to protect people but i want to bring up something in the bible Uh oh we're going there or maybe not something in the bible maybe say something outside the bible but there was kind of a situation ship that happened just a situation no situation ship doesn't make any sense <laughs> situation that happened no because a situation ship is like a relationship that's like in a situation right <laughs> and that's not this well it isn't it isn't this with me i have nothing to do with this story i'm just the recipient of the of the of the, of the story okay basically i think this is interesting i'm gonna keep it very vague because i haven't asked permission for this i'm just gonna give the general scenario and not names or relationships or anything. okay but basically a friend of mine um said that their their other friend was going through a hard time and was like okay what's going on and they were like look uh someone that they know basically had has come to know jesus and has like started a relationship with god had grown up in the church but kind of has been outside the church and now they're like back in it and they're figuring out all these things for the first time and they told their friend basically like you're not your family's not gonna go to heaven because they weren't predestined. And I guess her family doesn't believe in God. They're, you know, they're um, a different religion. And this person kind of went out of their way to say, like, you know, that they're not going to heaven, right? They're, they're going to go to hell. They're not predestined. And so I just, you know, immediately, like, I, I don't hate a lot of things. I hate Calvinism. I don't hate Calvinists. So basically, I said something that offended my dad so badly about Calvinists that he made me cut it out of the episode. So I'm not going to use the metaphor that I used. But if I were to, I compared them to plastic bottles that swirl in the ocean for eternity. But you're not talking about people. You're talking about an idea. Or an I was ideology. just talking about ideas. I just compared the people to floating plastic objects. But I don't like that. Why? Because I don't care how much a person disagrees with me or how much I think a person's wrong. I believe they have infinite value because that's the reason I don't like Calvinism. It's because. But hold on, hold on. The people value. who would say that you, you, Austin, me, <laughs> are going to go to hell, I can't say that they're the equivalent of plastic bottles floating mindlessly, thoughtlessly. Spiritual, spirit, I can't even say anything. Just in the middle of the ocean, I can't compare them to that. I would prefer that you would not. <laughs> and, uh, and and the reason for that is because if you hate an ideology because it demeans and diminishes people who don't agree with you, you don't want to create a metaphor that demeans and diminishes people who disagree with you, because then we just become just like them. Look, I've always, I've always, always, always disagreed in, with you on how we behave in this way. <laughs> I've always thought to kill a monster, you have to become a monster. And you've always thought being peaceful like Jesus always wins everything. <laughs> Gee, I wonder which one Jesus would agree with. <laughs> I don't know, man. But this is the thing. Jesus didn't have 12 Jesuses. Jesus had 12 other guys. And the 12 other guys, I'm kind of like a few of the other ones. 
You know, Jesus killed the monster by um, becoming the purest expression of love in his sacrifice. He did. So I, I don't want to fight against Calvinists. I want to win them over to um, a more biblical and healthy view of God. I'm going to overdub you after this. I'm going to overdub you. I'm going to say, I don't want to fight with Calvinists. And then I, it's going to be my voice and say, I want to destroy you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right, let's get to the point. Let's get to the idea. Okay, so here's the point. Here's the reality of it. Basically right. this. What is predestination? <laughs> <laughs> what is Calvinism? And can you just, can we walk it back? Because in, I think when I, when I heard what this person said, I, I said, okay, look, let's, let's break this down. One, this person is, is, is young and young in their faith, young in their walk with Jesus, young in their, whatever you may call it in their spiritual journey. And I wouldn't say it's a spiritual journey. I think it's kind of a, a hijacked spiritual journey. That's become super religious, super quick. So what is it about Christians in general? Because this can happen to other religions. We don't talk about it enough in Christianity. How is it that we become these like Christian jihadists where we are super fundamental? We are scary in the destructive views and how we see other people and their damnation to whatever else is after this life. But what is it about us? And so I, I would love for us to maybe break. Are you down for this journey? Let's go. I'm in for I it. won't I won't be me on this podcast. I will be more like you. Because <laughs> I can't be like Jesus. I'll be more like you, and then maybe if I'm more like you, I'll be like Jesus later. <laughs> well, I just want you to think about the fact that there's someone listening who's a Calvinist who may not even know that they believe something that isn't biblical. They know. This is the no, thing. No, they this don't crazy. because if you, no, if you raise it. And no, you, because, no, and, no, no, I disagree with you because it's crazy because this person who doesn't know anything, one thing she's already been taught is that other people are going to hell before her. It's really sad, but, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the funny thing about fundamentalists is that 99% of the time it's built around hate speech. It's built around destructive belief systems and the projection of that on other people because that makes them feel better about themselves. And, and we wonder why people become so um, closed to the message of Jesus and begin hating God before they even know who he is. Um, okay. I, I'm going to go back. Uh, when I was um, a brand new follower of Christ, you know, I came to Christ when I was 20. And, and then I went from Chapel Hill to um, Southwestern Theological Seminary. I actually got my master's degree in theology. And in my first semester, and I'm brand new to faith, and I'm reading the Bible and really taking this seriously, um, I go to a lecture by a theologian named R.C. Sproul. And R.C. Sproul is one of the most famous Calvinists, Reformed Calvinist theologians in the world. <clears throat> and I didn't know anything about Calvinism. I didn't know anything about Arminian or all the different views uh, at that time. But listening to the source, listening to R.C. Sproul, who is really one of the experts, I walked away going, this is like a cult. It's a heresy. There's, there's no way that a person could actually believe that this view is coming from the scriptures. And so what I really want to like say at first is like my view in Calvinism didn't come from listening to people who were against Calvinism. It didn't come from people arguing against Calvinism. It was actually by studying under the people who are the leading experts in the world on Calvinism. And that's how I came to my conclusions and my views. In fact, uh, here I am, a brand new, really brand new follower of Christ. I'm in seminary getting this master's degree. I'm in a uh, theological preaching class where you're allowed to choose any path that you want. And I chose what would be one of the central Calvinist passages. As a brand new Christian, I chose Romans chapter nine, where um, it says, just as it is written, Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. What then shall we say is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And the reason I picked this passage is that it was one of the central passages that um, reformed theologians use saying, you see, God says, 
I will have mercy in whom I have mercy and compassion in whom I have compassion. Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated him. That's their theological justification, along with other passages, and we can destroy those too. And Which verse is this? This is Romans chapter 9, verses 13, nine. Uh, 14, and 15. Okay. And, and, and so the argument here is you see, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And this is why we know that God elects and predestines people. He elects you to be saved and elects you to be damned. He elects you to go to heaven. He elects you to go to hell. He predestines you uh, in this, before this life for eternity. And it's based on this passage where Paul is arguing, saying, How are, who are you to say God does not have mercy? Here's the problem. Calvinists do exactly what Paul was arguing against. See, when, when, Paul, when Paul is quoting God saying, I will have mercy on whom, whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. When he quotes God saying, I love Jacob and not Esau and hated Esau, he wasn't talking about the individuals, Jacob and Esau. If you study it historically, Jacob and Esau became a type. And so ironically, Esau was the firstborn. He was actually the one who should have been the lineage of Israel. He was the one that was given the birthright and the blessing. But he despised his birthright and his blessing, and he gave them both away or sold them to Jacob, whose name is Deceiver, who ends up becoming Israel. And so what God is actually saying is the one that you think should be chosen isn't going to be chosen if his heart isn't turned toward me. And the one that you think isn't chosen will be the chosen one if they turn their hearts to me. So actually Esau and Jacob are teaching us the exact opposite theological principle. And on top of that, the argument in Romans is not that God is electing people to go to hell and limiting how many people are going to heaven. It's the exact opposite argument. The Jewish Christians were angry because they wanted God to limit his compassion, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his salvation to only the Israelites. They were angry because God was too merciful, because God chose all the Gentiles. And it is astonishing to me the Calvinists use this passage to say exactly what Paul was violently arguing against. The Israelites wanted to limit God's compassion. They wanted to limit God's mercy. It wasn't God saying, hey, I elect who I elect, and so I, I can elect fewer people. I, I predestine who I predestine, so I can predestine fewer people. It was actually God saying the opposite. I will not be limited by your lack of mercy. I will not be limited by your lack of compassion. I will not be limited by your view of elitism that believes only a certain people should be predestined or elected or loved. God is saying you will never limit the ever expanding nature of my love. He's saying the exact opposite. He's not saying I've elected people so that you can, you can judge me if you want because I'm choosing fewer people. God is saying, no, I'm electing everyone and you can judge me if you want because I'm choosing more people than you want me to choose. Reformed Calvinism is the same theological elitism that Jesus was fighting against and that Paul fought against. You can go to every passage that Reformed Calvinism uses and realize that they change the narrative and Ignore the matter narrative. They ignore the meta narrative that God is giving, and even when it talks about predestination in uh, in Romans eight, just one chapter before that, when um, I think it's let me make sure I have the right passage. Romans eight twenty eight, right here, and it says, "And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose." And then it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. And that's where they stop. They say, you see, God predestines people. No, you need to finish the sentence. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's not saying he's predestining who comes to him. He's predestining what happens to you when you come to him. So you have an absolute choice. You have freedom. You have free will. You can choose God or reject God. But once you choose Jesus, you are now predestined to be conformed to his image. 
which I love. It's like God saying, if you'll give me your life, I will make sure you cross the finish line and you win. That's the kind of predestination we should be talking about. Not that God is selecting people and eliminating people, but that God, when you invite him into your life, guarantees that he has fixed the race and you win. Really intelligent academics lean toward Calvinism. I know. It's so frustrating. It's the smart people. But you also have to realize that probably some of the most intelligent people in the world, and I'm going to do it even though I shouldn't do it, are advocates of some of the most nefarious worldviews that have ever existed. It yeah. was not dumb people that created yeah. socialism. It was not dumb people that created Nazism. It is not dumb people. And one of the things that happens is that oftentimes people who are intellectually um, elite or arrogant begin to try to define how God works beyond their own capacity to understand. So why, are they, nat- why is that their natural inclination? I, I think it's because people think they're smarter than God and they need to explain God. And, uh, and, and they don't like the, um, that space of mystery and uncertainty that exposes our lack. I don't know everything. I don't understand everything. I do not have a comprehensive view of God. I don't know everything about him. I can't explain everything he does or everything he is or everything he thinks. I, I'm, I'm grateful that God has revealed himself to us and there are things we can know about him. But the moment we try to act like as if we have God pegged, we understand everything about how God does everything. Uh, we, I think we become fools. And, it, you know, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, Calvinism comes out of French elitism. And, and it comes out of the influence of the uh, Protestant Reformation, out of German intellectualism. And, and, and you know, it was, it, it's interesting because you're fighting things that need to be fought. You're fighting the corruption of the Catholic Church, which yeah. definitely needed to be fought. But at yeah. the same time, you're building your entire worldview on what a 22-year-old who writes the Institutes who has such a limited experience in life and uh, probably could never conceptualize people of different colors or ethnicities or um, uh, who, who were dramatically different than them actually being elected and loved by God. And, mm-hmm. and when you look at the outcome of John Calvin's life, you have to go, the theology lost its way when, uh, and he lost his way. And when you try to explain the sovereignty of God. This is a part of the thing is that people try to explain how God's in control of everything. And really, you're not going to be able to explain the sovereignty of God. You can trust it, you can, that God is in control, but you can't explain it because the world is out of control. The world is a mess. The world's a disaster. And it's hard to explain how God works in the midst of all of this chaos. And we have a need to try to explain that. And, and so what ends up happening is that you end up with a theological narcissism that says that God's singular intention is to glorify himself. And so then what glorifies God the most is electing people to be saved and electing people to be damned. And when you think the central principle of the universe is God's glory, then you think, well, then in some oddly nefarious way, all the evil and all the pain and all the suffering and all the destruction and then all the people who would be forever condemned, that somehow glorifies God more. And what I think is, is astonishing to me is if God's ultimate purpose is his own glory, he's done a terrible job because the world doesn't reflect him very well. And, and, and God did not have to give us free will if his ultimate intention was glory. He would, he would have been far more glorified if we never were able to choose against him. But if God's ultimate intention is love, and if that's the driving principle of the universe, then free will makes sense. Because you can have glory without free will, but you cannot have love 
without free will. John Calvin was a murderer. We no one likes to talk about that, especially Calvinists. But he tortured men, and was quoted to uh, say that that was within the will of God to torture men. Yeah, I, I do know that when he was the the mayor of Geneva, um, he actually uh, um, authorized the um, the murder of um, someone he considered a theological heretic to be burned at the stake. Yeah, I am persuaded that it is not without the special will of God that apart from any verdict of judges, the criminals have endured protracted torment at the hands at the hands of the executioner. A letter from John Calvin. Yeah, and that's how you can know that inherently John Calvin's internal compass was um, was off uh, because he wasn't driven with the principle of love, but judgment and condemnation, hatred, uh, arrogance. And, um, and you have to be careful when you're building your entire theological system with someone who, who did not love people. It's interesting. But I guess it really isn't about love, right? That's the whole belief system, that it's really truly about election. It's really all about uh, God's fame. That's the language, you know, God's fame, God's glory, uh, God's name. And, uh, and we're all here just to um, point back to how important God is. Um, which it, it, it's, it's so odd, you know, I mean, I wrote, I talked about this decades ago that if Calvinism is accurate, then God is a narcissist. And, um, and it's, in fact, it would be sociopathic to send billions of people to hell so that you could be elevated and be more famous. Uh, and, uh, and that, that to me is like, that's what's, that's, that's that's why I am so passionately opposed to this worldview is because it diminishes the character of God. It's, it's what it says to me about God that is so devastating. And then and what it says to people about God in relationship to them. And I don't know how to celebrate being chosen when people all around me, quote, are not chosen. Or even worse than that, they're chosen, but they're chosen for condemnation and, and hell. I never talked about that, about this position for years and years and years. And, and, uh, and, but probably over 20 years ago, I just saw a really strong movement among um, students across America uh, really being groomed and mentored to become Calvinists at a really high level. And um, even by people that I really love and respect and think are, are really good people who love God. They just really believe that this theology is, is um, uh, the only true perspective on the scriptures. And, and, um, but what I, what I think is really maybe some way indicative of, of its lack is that Calvinism is a very Western view. When Christianity went in every other direction, Calvinism did not naturally emerge. A Calvinism did not emerge in, um, in Eastern Orthodoxy. It did not emerge in African expressions of Christianity. It done, did not emerge in South or Central America. It, uh, it did not emerge in China when the gospel went there. It, uh, Calvinism really emerged from a Germanic, European, French. Um, I think it's important to note that um, Calvinism parallels so many aspects of cultural elitism and and that we have to like be able to extricate what the cultural influences were on actually a theological, uh, theological perspective. Okay, so your final take on Calvinists. <laughs> Calvinism. well, we probably should open this up to questions and come back and do a follow-up uh, because I think we're going to get some intense questions, some heated questions, some important questions. And, and frankly, I, I would love to answer those questions. I actually think that the scriptures are so clear that John Calvin was wrong and that Tulip is wrong. I have a comparison. I have a question and a comparison. Yeah. Um, without, without, there's obviously, you know, you get, you know, you get frustrated with me because I, I like to point out the negative moments and, and things. But, um, you know, someone, when this friend had asked me, you know, what do you think of this? I said, there's, there's a lot of odd similarities to, the Nazi movement and Calvinism in just in this kind of nefarious nature of there are people who are chosen people who are not. And we talked about this the other day, if Hitler had been 
uh, had had the vision to to just take over the world and not be not create a genocide movement against the Jewish people, we would probably all be Germans because two very powerful communities that were within one section of the world could have easily dominated the world, I believe. But when it became, um, and I do feel like that was the, that maybe the, the, the rock that broke that wave that God had placed inside of Germany, a, a beautiful and great people group, that, that I think the whole world rallied around to defend and to, to help, you know, protect that ended up bringing, being the downfall of, of that system. But there is, there are odd similarities between, you know, this idea of predestination and election and Calvinism and like the Nazi movement that, that Hitler brought into the world. So there, that's how I feel. I thought it was interesting. My friend said the same thing. They were like, no, no, this is what this person said was like, this feels like Nazi movement. I, and, 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 I, I have great self-restraint <clears throat> and so I, um, but as I was sharing, I actually had that thought. I just, I just um, edited myself that if you were to be really objective, Calvinism is a parallel to a theological Nazism. Being in means you're a part of a very small exclusive group. I mean, God chose you. It's inescapable mm-hmm. that there's a level of elitism when you realize God chose you and he did not choose or chose for it condemnation the majority of the people in the world and so you are whether you like it or not an elitist uh in in um in that that ideology in that view um there there is something else and maybe aaron you can talk for a minute because i i want i want to give myself a moment to bring it back but um does this make you feel uncomfortable talking about this no actually i think it's so important um you know, I'm at the age now where I just got to like say what I really think about these things because I want it on record. And uh, I've said it in the past. And, and, um, but because I'm not usually talking to, to Christians, it's not something I'm talking about all the time. No. Uh, this is really a conversation within Christianity. And, you know, and I, I've had conversations with, you know, John Piper, who's also a renowned um, Reformed theologian and, um, and, and, and frankly, you know, how were those conversations? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a person who tends to like almost everyone, you, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and I remember even one of the early conversations we had, I said, John, what do you think your new central message is? And he said, oh, it's, it's about, you know, joy. It's about living in the pleasure of God. And, and I said, oh, well, I got that down, man. I, I really live in the pleasure of God. I really just love life and enjoy it. And he said, I'm better at teaching at it. I'm not that good at really experiencing it. And, and, right. and, and I think that's one of the things that I, I actually think Calvinism has an incredible danger of sucking the joy out of life and, um, and stealing your joy. And, um, and there's just so many subtleties to it that can become um, so destructive along the yeah. way. Because um, I don't think, I don't think... Calvinist, you know, and he was, you know, obviously John Piper was heavily influential at a, at a few places that I studied. And, you know, he was very influential in Southern California. He taught at Fuller Seminary for a long time, or not for a long time, for a few years. But, um, and then at Bethel University, which you were also connected to at one point, yeah. which I didn't even realize yeah. he had he had taught there. Did you know he had taught there? Oh, yeah. I, that's when I met him when I used to go up to um, uh, to St. Paul all the time. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, no, they so, brought me in to consult at his church one time. And, that's uh, interesting. So but he was, yeah. but we obviously know that, like, I don't think he would say he wouldn't be spreading. I don't think he would have been such an advocate for Calvinism within the, I, I don't think his main driving, what is it, like purpose would have been like that God's a narcissist than believing that or that God needs all of the glory, right? No, he, he, of course, he would never say God's a narcissist, but he would say that um, uh, that God's intention, God's entire purpose is to bring glory to himself and that our purpose is to glorify God, to uh, to increase his fame, you know, and um, yeah, and, and he would teach um, election and uh, double election. What would, you know, that God chooses people to be saved and God chooses people to be condemned. Yeah, that would be a, a core part of the theological view, 
Yeah, Jesus I, I did always, not die for the world. That Jesus only died for the elect. What I always find interesting about this this worldview, which is why I think it's inherently evil and inherently incorrect, because the person who's discovering these things are elected. The people who are discovering these things and preaching these things are the ones that are elected. It's almost mm-hmm. never the if someone said like, "Hey, this is real." There's elected and, and, and the people who are not elected, there's double election. And I'm not elected. I figured it out. I'd be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a list and I'm not on it. But it's always, from, it's always from the perspective of I'm on the list and you're not. There's an unexpected commonality between Calvinism and Islam and Buddhism and atheism in that they're, and, and Hinduism and, in that, that they're all fatalistic. They all believe that our choices are, in that sense, um, irrelevant to our destination. And, and so, you know, Calvinism believes that you're elected, and uh, Buddhism believes we're all moved toward nothingness, and um, atheism believes that it's all mathematical and that our uh, freedom and choices are an illusion. And, and I think we need to realize that um, Calvinism was designed when the world was still seen from a fatalistic uh, worldview. And, we, you know, I mean, um, he was, you know, he, he understood the world all, not even as well as Newton understood the world, and Newton done, did not understand the world properly. And, uh, and, you know, and so this idea that history is a fine line and that, you know, the, the whole language of God's perfect will and imperfect will, it's like it's all based on a very fatalistic view of reality. And, you know, just, just what we know about reality, the way God designed the universe, the way that God designed everything that exists, lets us know that, that they couldn't possibly understand all the iterations of possibilities of how God could be doing what he does in the world. And, um, and so I, I just feel like, well, I'd be shocked. I mean, I, I'm shocked when Kyrie Irving says the world is flat, right? And or when I, I'm, and there are other people too, right? There's like these people who are flat world society people, and and so I'm kind of shocked. I'm like, wow. I mean, yeah, I guess technically you've never like traveled the Earth and proved that it's round, but I think there's enough information to know the world is round. And so, if you still believe the world is flat, you're sort of trapped in an ancient view. That was intelligent at one time. That was actually considered probably scientific at one time. The idea that the sun and the universe revolved around the earth was actually biblically based because they believed that earth was the center of the universe. And so, of course, everything revolved around the earth. It would be heresy, it would almost be paganism to think that the earth revolved around the sun. And, and yet we now know that was wrong. And one of the things that I'm shocked about is that there are still people who are advocating for a view of God and an interpretation of the scriptures that was built in in a time where understanding reality was so off. And and by the way, their understanding of God and the scriptures was incredibly off. And maybe it's time to have uh, a new conversation um, about how God works in the world. So Aaron, I'm glad you wanted to talk about it. I, I, I have a caustic personality, so I like to just make it feel like I'm trashing everything and everyone. But really, in reality, I genuinely want to get to the bottom of it. I think the more, the more time I spend with Christians, the more toxic I realize this world is. You know, I called you yesterday and had said that I found out that a guy that we ran into in London, his son, who's, I don't know, he's a man boy. I don't think he's probably under the age of 25, was like talking trash on me and saying that- And you don't even know him. I don't even know him. And like, my thing is this, like, if you want to run your mouth, send an address, send an address and let's take care of this the old way. I think what I've realized though, is that, you know, because we talked about it and it really, it does, it does affect me when people talk negatively. Though everything I've learned from all of the personality tests and all of the analytic like consulting stuff that we've been a part of and the training I've gone through is that I don't care about what people think of me. I do care when they lie about me. And there's something about this world that we have, you know, 
been embedded in that I've been born into that is really toxic. And, you know, and I've, I've, we've experienced both sides, the loving goodness of it all. And also the, the heavy toxicity of religion. And, and I do think both are just connected to the human disorder that we are human. And that when you feel self-righteous, you will act self-righteous. Mm -hmm. You feel like you are better than you will treat people like you were better than. And the reality, and this is where I'm going to quote my favorite cowboy, Rip from Yellowstone and John Dunn from Yellowstone, when they have this conversation with this young boy that they kind of took in off the streets, when he says, you know, one thing that I had to learn is that no one deserves it, that no one deserves any of this beautiful life that we have. And that's what makes it beautiful. The moment you think you deserve it is the moment you're probably going to lose it. And, mm. and I think it's one of, it's that, that forever paradox of be deserving of it and never think you deserve it, mm. you know? And so even inside of the, all this conversation around predestination or people talking about people, it, it's just the reality that like we are human and that we are going to try our best. One thing that I'm encouraged by with Calvinism is that they're trying their best to figure something out, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that frustrates me most with religion in general is that why are we trying so hard to figure this out? And not that we need to lay passively and take what is fed to us, but there's some things just that are never understood. Why we have a human need to talk about people we don't know. Why we grieve and mourn for people we've lost. There are so many things in this world that we don't understand. And that is a part of, I guess, what is encouraging and what is terrifying about this life for me. What actually compels me to still talk about Jesus, uh, to still give my life, uh, to help people discover who he is, is that my love for people is, is, so small in comparison to his love for people that God's love is infinite, that God's love is ever expansive. That I, if I were having to convince God to care about more people, I, I think I would just go do something else. If I had to convince God to be more merciful than me, or to be more compassionate than me, if, if somehow Becoming theologically sound is caring less about people and being less open about more people, then this doesn't work for me. And what I have found in my life is a God who loves more than I could ever imagine, who is more merciful than I could have ever perceived, who is more compassionate than I could hope for, a, a God who loves all of humanity. A, uh, a God who sent his son in the person of Jesus, who didn't die simply for the elect, but he died so that everyone would be elect. He died so that every human being could know forgiveness and freedom and love and acceptance. And the reason I live my life uh, following Jesus is because um, the argument that he always made was there's always room for more. and um, and. And anyone who thinks that they care more than God doesn't understand who God is. Uh, I, I want my life to be an ever-increasing reflection of how much Jesus loves every human being and values every human life. I love that. And with that said, should we wrap this up, Dad? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, an intense one, a deep one, a theological one. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this conversation. Let us know. and and. Uh, in fact, Aaron, you, you can tell them how to let us know. Well, if you're listening to this and you are a Calvinist, just trust that God elected us to have this conversation. This conversation was always predestined and that you were always meant to hear it. Um, if you dislike us, that same logic doesn't work for you. <laughs> no, we're going to wrap this up. I'm um, just really grateful for everybody who tunes in each week. You know, as we get back into Bad Ready in 2023, I'm excited about these conversations. I'm excited about all the projects we're working on and excited to be a part of this team. I love you, Dad. Um, yeah, I love you too, buddy. Thanks.
thank you for letting us access your big brain and thank you for letting me upset you enough and keep going and fighting through the conversations. I love you a lot. Thank you everybody for listening. You can write a review. You can subscribe. You can check us out on YouTube uh, if you want to see our faces. Also, give us a share. Give us a like. Give us a comment. Check us out on Instagram. We love you guys. See you next Friday. See you next week.